Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Robert, for your very kind introduction. Um, it's really great to be back here at the Oriental Institute. It's been a few years since I was here. Um, I actually don't remember the year I came, but I think I spoke to the uh, American Research Center in Egypt, Chicago chapter in this very room uh, with an update on discoveries from Anubis Mountain and our work on the tomb of Sun Wazir III. So it's great to be back and uh, bring you up to date with uh, some new discoveries of recent years. Um, I had heard via my wife that, Robert, you thought my title was a little long. So the slide there uh, begins with a, a sort of attenuated version of the title. Uh, for the longer version, of course, see the flyer, but uh, the Pharaohs of Anubis Mountain. Um, my topic tonight is uh, a fascinating site um, in southern Egypt. Uh, it's part of a greater site called Abydos, where I've been working for 20 years. Um, it's a place that we are only really beginning to appreciate um, over the, the course of, I think, really the last two or three years in terms of the scope of the site, uh, the importance and significance of what is buried beneath the sands at this particular place. Um, it's a sacred site uh, that to the Egyptians um, had particular religious significance, as you'll see in the name there, Anubis Mountain. Um, it's a place that had uh, connotations for them associated with funerary religion and the significance of the pharaoh and what happens to him in the afterlife. Um, they called this place Anubis Mountain. We'll see why that's the case. And it became the burial ground of a series of pharaohs um, over the course of Egypt's Middle Kingdom and Second Intermediate Period. And uh, in the, just the last uh, two years, we have uh, increased dr uh, quite dramatically the number of pharaohs we know are associated with the site. Uh, now there are 12 different kings, uh, kings both great and small, um, who use this as their burial ground. So uh, just two starting images of the ongoing work uh, from recent seasons. Um, my goal tonight is to essentially walk you through some of the aspects of the site. We don't have time to go into a lot of the, the issues of interpretation and uh, the data, but to give you an appreciation for the significance of this particular place. And uh, the image that you see here, I think, will uh, help to uh, kind of uh, give you an appreciation for the, the way the Egyptians themselves viewed this place. Um, this is the site we're talking about. Uh, a, a, a part of the desert landscape um, of the greater site of Abydos in southern Egypt. This is an area of uh, flat, um, kind of featureless desert sand that washes up against the high limestone cliffs um, of the western side of the Nile Valley. And you'll see in this particular image, uh, one uh, very dramatic feature of this part of Abydos is uh, what appears to be almost a sort of a natural uh, pyramid-shaped peak that rises up over the desert landscape. This is the site of Anubis Mountain. Um, and about 10 years ago, we, we actually were fortunate enough to identify the name of this place uh, through a very fortunate uh, sort of um, uh, custom that the ancient Egyptians had at a certain time in their history, this time of the Middle Kingdom, uh, which begins about 2000 BC and continues on to about 1700 BC. Uh, they love to stamp things in their bureaucratic and administrative system. Uh, they use administrative stamps of various sorts. Um, and some of these were um, institutional stamps of the type that you see here. Uh, this thing, this uh, object in the middle, um, is a clay impression of an actual stamp um, that is not preserved to us, but the impression um, has survived, in this case, in hundreds and hundreds of examples of a necropolis seal that has a very simple statement on it. It just says, the mountain of Anubis, or Anubis Mountain in hieroglyphs. And so uh, when you look up at this uh, kind of natural pyramid-shaped mountain, this seems to betray some of the religious ideas the Egyptians um, had in their minds when they gazed upon this. A mountain, a sacred peak uh, that's imbued with the essence um, of the jackal god Anubis. Anubis is one of the primary uh, 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 funerary deities in ancient Egypt. Um, he's particularly significant um, in rituals of mummification, the preparation of the body for the journey to the afterlife, but he's also integral to um, the royal afterlife and the idea of uh, the royal necropolis. And in this particular instance, we think the mountain itself uh, was a protective kind of natural aspect of the landscape that rises up over what became a very important royal necropolis. So Anubis here is the protector of this place. Um, in case you're, you're not familiar with the site of Abydos, uh, many of you will be, others uh, perhaps less so. Um, here you see uh, just a, a general map of Egypt, the Mediterranean up here. Uh, the first cataract, or Elephantine, here to the south, Abydos there in red. It's in southern Egypt, uh, not far to the north of the famous monuments at Thebes. Um, uh, Abydos is a, 
a great site with uh, many thousands of years of Egyptian civilization represented uh, in its archaeology. Um, Anubis Mountain itself, um, this is a site uh, that develops during uh, the Egyptian, what we, what we would call in archaeological terms, the Middle Bronze Age. Um, in historical terms, this includes Egypt's Middle Kingdom, uh, which is the time of uh, dynasties 11, 12, and 13. Um, into what we call the second intermediate period, one of the phases of fragmentation and breakup where uh, Egypt's political system uh, began to face certain challenges. Um, the territory of Egypt fragments into a number of rival kingdoms. Um, and Anubis Mountain reflects the changes from one of these great eras of unity and prosperity and tremendous power of the pharaohs uh, represented in this tomb that we've been working on, a massive tomb one of the largest tombs in all of Egypt. This is the tomb of one of the great pharaohs at the height of Egypt's 12th dynasty, Senwazert III, or Sesostris III, if you prefer his name in the Greek version. Um, I'll call him Senwazret tonight. Um, this is one of the great rulers of uh, one of the most unitary phases of ancient Egypt. He was able to build one of the largest tombs ever created. Um, this is a massive monument. Uh, we'll look at the work there in just a second. Uh, this monument goes beneath the mountain of Anubis, um, 100 feet into the bedrock and cut itself surmounted by that mountain um, is the monument you see there. Um, on the lower right-hand side is a much more sort of humble king representing Egypt's second intermediate period. Um, as Egypt, uh, pro uh, over time, um, uh, uh, develops into this phase that we call the second intermediate period, uh, the territory of Egypt is broken up into a series of rival kingdoms. Uh, the era is one of the most debated um, of all of uh, pharaonic history. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of gray zones and debated issues. Uh, recently, we've had uh, the luck to actually discover a whole new group of kings who ruled during this fragmentary period of the second intermediate period. So Anubis Mountain includes kings both great and small, one of the greatest of ancient Egypt. Pharaoh Senwazret III, and then there on the lower right-hand side, the burial cha chamber of the recently discovered Pharaoh Seneb Kai, um, who we just discovered in January of 2014, and we're still working on uh, his tomb and tombs around it. Um, so um, just a, a, a few comments about uh, the work at this site. It's really been a very exciting ride so far. We have uh, had the, the luck to discover, in fact, a whole new dynasty um, as Robert mentioned, um, sort of the highlight of this is the, the very modest uh, but still royal tomb of King Seneb Kai, which you see here in the foreground, um, much, much smaller than the great underground structure belonging to King Senwazert III that we'll take a look at in just a second. But nonetheless, a really tremendous and exciting discovery, um, a new pharaoh, um, and just uh, a few images of this, a very exciting moment in my life. It's one that I will never forget. Um, we were excavating uh, just a, a few weeks before the end of the season, uh, really, act, in fact, uh, sort of closing up uh, the season's work um, in January of 2014, um, and came upon uh, what I initially thought would be uh, the entrance to a private tomb, a relatively modest uh, non-royal tomb, uh, which you see there being uncovered, uh, the workmen brushing away the brickwork. You can see there's a structure emerging in the sand, which led us down to a doorway. Um, and there you see me pondering uh, the entrance to this tomb. We had no idea what we were looking at at that point, uh, but you can see that there's a broken uh, limestone gate or portcullis, a sliding slab that was the actual entrance to this tomb. Um, as time was winding down at this point in 2014, I began to be a little worried about the, t the, the time that might be involved in excavating this tomb, so there I am pondering the sand. Uh, my wife at the time, um, standing there uh, as I was looking into the doorway of the tomb asked me, well, what do you see? Um, those are some very famous words in the history of Egyptology. <laughs> Back in 1922, someone else asked that same question. So, of course, what kind of response must one give as an Egyptologist? Why wonderful things, of course. Um, well, it was just sand, in fact. Uh, but what turned out to be beyond that broken doorway was, uh, in fact, wonderful things. A beautifully painted tomb, uh, of uh, this newly discovered pharaoh Seneb Kai. Um, here you see the beautiful images of goddesses that decorate the tomb and, in fact, his name in hieroglyphs uh, that uh, inform us uh, uh, as, as to his identity. Um, so this was very exciting. Uh, we were 
quite astounded to discover this tomb um, and not, in fact, at all sure as to the exact date uh, for uh, a number of days. Uh, Professor Rittner had a number of emails from me where I had questions about certain forms of hieroglyphs and such, such things. Um, uh, but within, in fact, uh, about a week, we were pretty certain as to the time frame we were looking at. There were a lot of other clues um, as to that. So this was a very exciting uh, recent discovery that has, in fact, um, added significantly to our appreciation of Anubis Mountain um, and the pharaohs that are buried there. Um, just an image of the, the work in the tomb, and also this helps you to appreciate the scale of it. It's a very modest tomb. This is not what you think of when you think of one of the great pharaohs of Egypt, such as Khufu building his great pyramid at Giza, or some of the, the big tombs in the Valley of the Kings. A very modest tomb of a king of uh, you know, not, not substantial means. Um, and in fact, the small scale of the tomb tells us uh, something about the historical context uh, to his, his reign, which I will uh, return to at the very end of the lecture tonight. Um, there's uh, two of my collaborators on the tomb, my wife Jennifer on the right, who's here tonight, um, sitting next to Robert, and um, also my former student, uh, Dr. Kevin Cahale, who's uh, done a lot of work with us on the tomb of Sanabkai. It was very exciting to discover this king, this newly discovered pharaoh. Uh, his name had never been found before. No one, in fact, knew he existed. Um, and um, I'm, I'm actually old enough that I'm quite astounded sometimes by uh, the internet and the speed at which information suddenly travels around the world at the speed of light. Uh, but uh, within just uh, two days of the Ministry of Antiquities, um, the Egyptian Antiquities uh, ministry releasing information about the discovery of this new king. Um, he had a Wikipedia page. Someone put it together. It wasn't me. Uh, fortunately, the information is largely correct, but um, he went from being an unknown king, entirely anonymous, um, forgotten for thousands of years. Now he has his own Wikipedia page. Um, so kind of mind-boggling how such things happen. Um, in the last two years, uh, as we've continued at the work at Anubis Mountain, uh, what actually in fact began relatively recently with the discovery of a new pharaoh, has uh, just compounded more and more as we've explored the terrain around Senebkai's tomb. Um, in fact, we now have uh, tombs of a whole series of kings um, that belong to this particular group. Um, there's eight tombs. Some of them are actually larger than Senebkai's in scale. Um, these are tombs that were all plundered in ancient times by tomb robbers. Uh, so there's only little bits and pieces remaining um, of the burial assemblages that once uh, filled these, these burial chambers. But you can see some of these other adjacent tombs. Uh, we believe these are all, um, in fact, successors to Senebkai, kings that reign uh, during this uh, period of the second intermediate period. So um, he's one of a group of kings that chose Anubis Mountain as their burial site, as their royal cemetery uh, during the second intermediate period. But the reason they came there is that uh, this particular site, uh, the, the, the development of it had already occurred. Um, from the 12th dynasty, uh, we have the establishment of uh, this, is, this place is a royal necropolis by the great pharaoh Senwazir III. At the height of the 12th dynasty, around 1850 BC, um, he built this monster tomb, um, which you see here on the landscape. Um, the entrance to it is cut into the bedrock at the base of Anubis Mountain. Um, it was built inside of a massive uh, brick enclosure that, that uh, pushes up all the way up to the very base of the limestone cliffs. Uh, the whole thing is about 800, 800 feet long from its entrance to the innermost part that's currently known, which, as we'll see, doesn't actually appear to be the end of the tomb. It appears to be bigger than what we know. Um, but look at the scale of this thing. It's massive um, in comparison uh, to the tomb of Senebkai, which is up here, a very kind of modestly scaled structure. So the range and scale is, is significant, uh, but Senwazir III established this place. Um, his tomb is the anchor point uh, for uh, a place that was returned to by successive pharaohs. And um, one of the things we've been doing is exploring this huge terrain around the tomb of Senwazir III. You'll notice that uh, this sort of T-shaped enclosure that contains the entrance to his tomb is flanked by a whole series of other buildings. Um, and particularly in this, this area up here, um, on the northeastern side of this uh, enclosure of Senwazir III, we have some other very large structures, two really massive tombs um, that we have investigated recently. 
Um, they've been known, in fact, the existence of these has been known for well over 100 years, and there was some uh, early work done uh, by the Egypt Exploration Fund, uh, the British uh, uh, Egyptological Research Organization, uh, back in 1902-1903. They sort of plumbed down into the centers of these structures and um, made uh, sort of basic plans of the architecture that they could, uh, could see at that point. Um, we've returned to those. Um, uh, one of my collaborators, a former student, Don McCormack, um, has been examining this structure, uh, what we call Tomb S9, a really massive structure with a huge subterranean uh, burial chamber cut way, way down into the bedrock. Um, and then this one over here, uh, we've just uh, completed the excavation of that uh, this summer. Um, at this point, we have, in fact, um, uh, not entirely conclusive evidence, but very strong indications for a really fascinating uh, phenomenon, which appears to be a group of very important kings who reign in the middle part uh, of a dynasty called the 13th Dynasty. Uh, these are three kings who are brothers. Um, the first of them is a king by the name of Neferhotep, or Neferhotep I. Um, you can see he's uh, identified there tentatively with this tomb S9. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Oriental Institute's uh, Egyptian collection, there's a beautiful statue um, thought to belong to Nef Neferhotep I on display in the Egyptian gallery, which I was a little bit disappointed to see when I went in there this evening, is now on loan to the Metropolitan Museum for their Middle Kingdom exhibition, but um, there's a photo of it, at least, on display. Um, this is the same king whose statue from Abydos exists in your own museum here. Uh, we believe he was buried at Abydos. He's one of a group of three brothers um, who we know, we know quite a lot about their family. Um, Neferhotep is the eldest of the brothers. He was uh, then succeeded by a very ephemeral, mysterious um, uh, individual uh, named Sa Hathor. Um, and recent evidence suggests that they may in fact have begun a tomb at Anubis Mountain for this second brother named Sa Hathor uh, that was abandoned. It was never completed because his reign seems to have, have lasted not more than about six months. Um, some people suggest he never even took the throne officially. Uh, but there's an abandoned complex. And then another one um, that we call S10 uh, that we've uh, gathered uh, recent evidence uh, very strongly suggesting it belongs to the third of these three brothers. His name is Sobek Hotep, and we know him as Sobek Hotep IV. Uh, these were very powerful kings who uh, had origins in southern Egypt. They were very active at Abydos, um, and we have major construction activity um, in the area of the great Osiris Temple. Um, these guys were very dedicated, in fact, to Abydos, and we'll, we'll like take a look at them again in a little bit as well. Um, so Sanwazir III establishes this place. He builds his monstrous tomb beneath Anubis Mountain. Later kings, uh, quite possibly these three brothers, Neferhotep and Sahathor, briefly, and then Sobekhotep IV seem to have uh, been inspired to add their own tombs. And then finally, uh, somewhat later, uh, we have this group of kings in the second intermediate period, including Senebkai and these other ones that you see here, adding their own tombs. So we have a group of tombs, some of them identified. We have names we can associate with them definitely, and in some cases, probably. We have other ones that are still entirely anonymous. And I think there are probably more of them, because this is a huge landscape. Um, you see the, the enclosure of Sanwazrit III here that includes the entrance to his subterranean tomb that goes beneath Anubis Mountain. Uh, there's big empty areas that are still actually unexplored within this. Uh, there may be additional tombs. We did, we've done ground-penetrating radar um, uh, in an attempt to try and uh, determine what might be beneath uh, the very deep sand deposits in this area. Uh, we know there's some kind of an anomaly, um, in fact, uh, in this enclosure um, on the other side, uh, sort of balancing the entrance to the tomb of Sanwazir III. There may be another uh, kind of large subterranean structure, uh, possibly another tomb. We have some very other very impressive buildings. Uh, these ones that you see here, we've actually spent quite a lot of time excavating and we, we actually don't know what they are at all. Uh, they're probably also royal structures, possibly additional royal tombs, uh, but they remain question marks. So we're exploring this place, uh, but um, in the last 
two to three years, it's really become increasingly obvious how important this place was to the ancient Egyptians. Um, let's begin with a look at this uh, massive tomb of Senwazir III uh, beneath Anubis Mountain. Uh, this has been a long-term project of mine. Um, my wife, like, well, um, uh, it's, it's one of my... It's one of the loves of my life, I have to say. My, my, my wife calls it Joe's Folly. Um, the process of excavating this tomb um, has taken us at this point uh, well over 10 years. Um, what you see is a, an isometric, a cutaway of the architecture of this gigantic tomb uh, that's cut into the deserts, down into the bedrock. There's no superstructure above it. It's entirely subterranean, and the interior of it extends um, at a depth of about 100 feet from the desert surface, where you see these men working uh, directly beneath the mountain. Um, this is a, a very fascinating monument um, built at, 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 during a period where we have one of the, the, the wealthiest, most powerful kings of the height of Egypt's Middle Kingdom. Uh, there we see him, uh, Senwazir III. Um, his reign is about 1850 BC. Uh, we know that this king had a lot of interest in the site of Abydos. Uh, one of the reasons for that um, is the cultic and religious uh, focus of, of greater Abydos on the, the cult of this particular deity, uh, the god Osiris, who is the sort of premier uh, uh, funerary deity in ancient Egypt, um, the king of the netherworld, the pharaoh of the afterlife. Um, Abydos was his principal cult center. Um, and the Middle Kingdom is one of the classical eras of, of the development of this place. Um, Senwazir III built extensively, he and other pharaohs of this era, um, up here in the north part of Abydos, uh, where there was a, a temple complex dedicated to Osiris. Um, he was interested in um, uh, sort of uh, developing the activities associated with an annual um, procession uh, that ran from the Osiris Temple um, out here to a site called Umm el Ghab today. Uh, which is, in ancient times, the burial place of Egypt's first pharaohs, um, the pharaohs of the first dynasty and some kings of the second dynasty uh, were buried here. And in later times, the Egyptians believed Osiris himself was buried there. And so there was a, a procession that connected his temple with his presumed burial place. So Nwazir III seems to have developed particular interest in the cult of Osiris, and he decided for some reason to build this tomb there. But when he did so, he already had another tomb. Um, so Nwazir III is one of a handful of Egyptian pharaohs who have given us a little bit of a conundrum uh, because he has multiple burial places. Um, in the Middle Kingdom, pharaohs were still building pyramids. And uh, every king of the 12th dynasty built a pyramid up in northern Egypt uh, near the capital city called Ichitawi. Um, Senwazir III's pyramid, which you see here, is at a site called Dashur. Um, and we know that he had largely completed this uh, in the first uh, decade and a half of his reign. Uh, but then he builds this other tomb in southern Egypt at the site of Abydos, uh, this monster tomb beneath Anubis Mountain. So there's many interesting questions that, of course, come up. Why was he motivated to build a second tomb? Um, was one of these intended to be the actual burial place, and the other one then becomes purely a sort of a symbolic tomb? Um, many people in the past um, have thought that this tomb at Abydos was what we call a cenotaph, just a symbolic Symbolic tomb. It was never actually used for the king's burial. So in excavating it, we're addressing these questions and certain other ones about the significance of this place. Um, we, we knew that the tomb existed um, back when we started uh, excavation right above the entrance to it in 2004. Um, and the reason we knew about it uh, is that it, it had been actually discovered um, uh, slightly over 100 years ago um, back in... Uh, 1904, or 1902, 1903, sorry, uh, the British Egypt Exploration Fund had uh, one of the, uh, the young uh, colleagues of uh, the, uh, the very famous excavator, Flinders Petrie, had been working in this area, and he had discovered the entrance to this tomb and uh, did a sort of a cursory examination of it. But then it sanded up, and it was not accessible um, until we began work there in 2004. Um, it had never been properly excavated. There were a lot of questions about what this tomb represents. Uh, is it a tomb or a cenotaph? Um, was the king buried at Abydos? Um, is his interest in Osiris 
uh, so significant that he chose this as his burial place. Uh, certain aspects of the architecture that we knew about at that time suggested this tomb is a very important kind of transitional monument um, that links the early, earlier pyramid tradition in Egypt with the emergence of a new form of royal burial place in which they, they abandon the built pyramid superstructure um, and uh, gravitate towards the natural landscape. And that's what we see in this case. Uh, there's no standing superstructure, but rather the symbolic uh, mountain of Anubis rising up above the tomb. So we've been excavating it. Uh, we reop re reopened it um, after about nine months of excavation, going down through the desert sands. Um, in the winter of uh, 2005, 2006, we opened, reopened the tomb. Um, and this is what I often call my best Christmas present ever. Um, it was basically Christmas Day, I guess it was 2005, and within a day or two of, of that date, we, we actually reopened the tomb um, and gained access to the interior. Since that time, we have been progressively working our way inwards, ex systematic, systematically excavating this gigantic tomb, and it's been a huge job. Uh, the first thing one has to contend with in a tomb like this, of course, is the guardians. Um, you have to pass through the guarded entrance way. Uh, there you just see three of the, the workers. Um, my, my workers love this part of the site more than any other. Um, it's, a, it's an air, area where um, a lot of sort of machismo comes out amongst the workers um, as we grapple with uh, massive fallen blocks of masonry and huge amounts of material in this, this monstrous monument. Um, anyway, this is, this is the actual entrance to this uh, tomb of Senwazret III. Um, this monument is a tremendous feat of architectural engineering. Um, it's cut into the bedrock, goes down 100 feet below the desert surface, and not only that, they didn't just hew it, cut it into the bedrock, but they brought thousands and thousands of tons of masonry blocks, beautiful limestone blocks, um, others of quartzite and granite, thousands of tons from hundreds of miles away. It all was brought to this place and brought underground and fitted to this tomb. So the, this architecture you see here, th this is not the bedrock. It's, wall, it's walls created out of massive limestone blocks that have been fitted within the cut space in the bedrock. Um, so it's a, it's a really kind of remarkable monument. It's one that uh, we found in a, a relatively damaged condition because ancient tomb robbers had, in fact, entered it, and um, they had da significantly damaged uh, extensive areas of it. So one of the things we've been contending with, of course, is uh, huge fallen blocking stones and um, a lot of rock debris and other material that is the result of the tomb robbery process. But we've been systematically working through this room by room for the last 10 years. And this is the, this is the space you just saw uh, in the process of excavation. That now looks like this. Um, you can see the floor of it in this beautiful, uh, what we call the pole roof ceiling, a, a simulation of the appearance of wooden logs, uh, but created instead, instead out of limestone, blocks of limestone that have been carved uh, to appear uh, like wooden logs spanning the, uh, the width of the chamber. Um, so just a, a few views of this, uh, uh, this tomb in the process of excavation. Here, this is the same space I just showed you, what we call the pole roof chamber, um, an amazing uh, space. The first, uh, the first chamber as you enter uh, the tomb itself, uh, there's just a detail of this beautiful carved ceiling. Um, as you go into the tomb, one of the, thing that, the things that is very obvious is uh, the tremendous effort that was put into very intricate systems of blocking and concealing uh, the succession from section to section as you progress into the inner burial compartments of San Wazir III. Um, there's a lot of uh, areas that are actually open passageways, like this one that you see here. Others that are now, now open passageways, but once upon a time were entirely blocked. And this is one of these. It's a huge section, about 50 meters long, uh, that was blocked from end to end with uh, hundreds of tons, giant uh, blocks of granite and quartzite and limestone um, completely sealing this. But now it's, been, it's, it's open because it had been broken through in ancient times by tomb robbers. So um, just some additional views as you work your way into the tomb, uh, some uh, really kind of uh, impressive architectural spaces. Again, um, uh, th this is one chamber in the process of excavation. Uh, you can see these big blocks that we had to contend with. 
Um, again, the fitted masonry, big limestone blocks that have been fitted into the, the, the space cut in the bedrock itself. Um, this is one of a pair of chambers that are um, about six meters tall um, and beautifully constructed, uh, connecting one with another by a doorway. Uh, this is the second one you see in the process of excavation, and another one of the blocking, the systems of blocking and protecting the royal burial uh, that we, we're now pretty certain was in the in, inner end of this tomb. Um, here's a, a roughly 50-ton block of granite, uh, which is the first blocking stone of an access passageway that led down uh, towards the inner end of the tomb. This had been dislodged in ancient times by tomb robbers, and it's still kind of hanging there on the edge of the, uh, the passageway that it goes down, that it blocks. Um, over the last year, we've been working in, um, we finally made it to the, what we call the inner end of the tomb, which is the most interesting part. This is where, um, up until actually just last year, we thought we had the burial chamber of Senwazret III. There's a chamber, very small in dimensions that you see here, that contains a granite sarcophagus. You can see the box of it here and the lid on top. Um, and a massive canopic chest, um, also out of granite, uh, with its lid there. Uh, these have been pulled out of their position, but um, uh, in fact, up until just last year, we thought that this was the burial chamber, um, that robbers had broken into this place, they had uh, dislodged uh, these containers, and they had broken in and rifled the mummy and taken whatever treasures were there, and the same with the canopic chest, until we began to excavate it, and we realized that this is not, in fact, the burial chamber at all. Um, this sarcophagus and the canopic chest are sitting on debris, um, sort of a yellow-colored uh, soft debris that is piled up in this particular chamber. Um, the ch this chamber is not the burial chamber, but it's a place where tomb robbers had actually pulled the, car the, the canopic chest and the sarcophagus out at some point, sliding it a, a long distance uh, from what seems to have been the inner, inner original burial chamber and just leaving them sitting in debris in this particular part of the tomb. Um, at this point, we're actually looking for the architecture, the location of the original setting uh, of this uh, sarcophagus and canopic chest of Senwazret III, and we've worked our way into this uh, very long, curving passageway, which you see here. It's quite impressive. It's, it's beautifully cut. Um, in some areas, it's a little bit rough because it's been damaged um, uh, over the millennia, uh, but it's lined with huge blocks of red quartzite. Um, the chambers of the inner part of this tomb were once beautifully lined uh, with multi-ton blocks of quartzite that came from 300 miles to the north, um, an area called the Jebel Ahmar, or the Red Mountain, uh, near modern Cairo, uh, very close to Cairo Airport today. This had come all the way down to Abydos and been, once upon a time, installed inside the tomb of Senwazret III. Um, so we've been investigating this inner end of the tomb, and some really fascinating uh, results have come out in terms of the stratigraphy and the evidence for the damage to this tomb. Uh, one of the things we can see is that tomb robbers um, in the, Roman, the, the late Roman period, and in, in continuing probably into the Byzantine period, had access to this tomb, and they were digging tunnels, uh, pitting around and uh, kind of exploring this inner part of Senwazret III's tomb, uh, they kicked up this uh, sort of yellow material. It's a yellow kind of softish stone, uh, which we can see geologically um, comes from areas below the level of this chamber where the, the burial, uh, where the, uh, car the canopic chest you see here and the sarcophagus are. Um, and also this passageway that the guys are working in. It comes from lower levels. There's tremendous amounts of it um, that had been pulled up into this part of the tomb. Um, and so at this point, uh, we've actually done some uh, probing of what we thought was the final chamber, which I'm not going to show you any images of, although it's a very impressive space. Um, the inner end of this, uh, we can now see, in fact, um, has indications of a, a sloping passageway uh, where this kind of a, a sort of a niche-like feature extends, um, suggesting that uh, the, the tomb extends beyond this into a still unexplored space uh, that probably is constructed in these lower yellow rock strata um, at deeper levels. Uh, we also think that there may be a, a big shaft um, that extends down below uh, this location of uh, the canopic chest and the sarcophagus. So uh, we've reached a very critical point. Um, uh, we, we think there's a lot more to this tomb and perhaps spaces there that we're going to ultimately 
uh, hopefully in, um, in, in the near future, get access to and begin to explore um, and help to understand the, the tomb beneath Anubis Mountain. So uh, 10 years of investment. I, I hope it'll pay off with some more information about the, the massive tomb. Uh, one of the important things that has come out uh, to, to this point, though, is that we can reconstruct the process of robbery of this great monument. Uh, we know we've recovered things like these alabaster vessel fragments that come from the original burial assemblage. Um, uh, almost certainly, there's a lot of evidence, not just artifacts from the tomb itself, but material around it that's, that demonstrate uh, almost certainly Senwazut III was buried in this tomb. Uh, but people knew about it, and uh, in fact, not long after the burial, during the second intermediate period, people broke into it and they plundered this massive monument. Uh, much, much later, in the Roman period, we can see from pottery like this, um, that other people came and they began to, in fact, use this tomb as a stone quarry, the beautiful masonry blocks that the Middle Kingdom architects had laboriously installed began to be pulled out again. Um, it's their beautiful blocks of quartzite and granite. They began to mine the tomb for this masonry. Uh, so it's an interesting and complex history of, of change. So this is the the tomb of Senwazit III, the nuclear tomb that establishes the necropolis of Anubis Mountain. But what of these other tombs that develop around it? This has been one of the big questions. Who came after Senwazit III, was interested enough, motivated for, for whatever reasons, to build their own tombs to add to the royal necropolis at Anubis Mountain, to make it more than just the burial place of one powerful king of the 12th dynasty? Um, so we've been investigating these uh, uh, adjacent structures, especially significant uh, are these two large ones, S9, uh, which we believe uh, belongs to Neferhotep I, um, and this one here, uh, S10, uh, in all likelihood um, uh, the burial place of King Sobekhotep IV, the brother and successor of Neferhotep. Um, some views of the, the recent work uh, this summer. Um, we've completed excavations of the structure uh, uh, called S10 here. Um, this has turned out to be a, a really kind of, a, a, again, a massive monument uh, with a huge subterranean burial chamber. Here you see the guys uh, excavating down in the environs of a, a burial chamber that is, in fact, it's architecturally all still intact. Um, there's an underground uh, monolithic burial crypt, uh, which I'll show you some photos of, um, that is closed beneath um, two lid stones, uh, one that you see here um, that weighs about 40 tons, and another one that's about 75 tons, sealing in uh, this subterranean crypt uh, that would have originally contained the burial of the king. Um, that's still in place, but unfortunately it had been broken into by ancient tomb robbers. And the way they did this is they initially seemed to have penetrated through a very complicated blocking system, um, breaking in through the side of these blocking stones and gaining access to the king's burial. Later on, just like in the tomb of Senwazir III, we can see from the artifacts at this place that in the late Roman period, in the Byzantine period, it became a stone quarry, and they just began stripping away this beautiful masonry. So what we have remaining is the substructure of a massive royal tomb, uh, probably the tomb of uh, Sobekhotep IV. So let's talk a little bit about these uh, fascinating brothers, the three brothers uh, in the sort of middle part of the 13th dynasty. Uh, these are three brothers that are attested quite nicely in a range of historical information, rock inscriptions, and uh, stele of different sorts. Um, we know uh, quite a bit about their family. Uh, they're the descendants of a, a non-royal individual, as are many of the kings of this particular era, the 13th dynasty. Um, his name was Ha-Anchef. Um, and this fragmentary stele, you actually see uh, two of these kings, Neferhotep I and Sobekhotep IV, commemorated along with other family members, uh, naming their father, Ha'anchef, their mother, who was a lady known as Kemi, um, and uh, some other uh, male family members that include uh, this guy, Sahathor, who is the third brother. Um, so here we see the names of two of them, Neferhotep I and Sobekhotep IV, other family members, including this guy, the ephemeral uh, third, uh, third brother, who in, in fact probably reigned very briefly between uh, Neferhotep I and Sobekhotep IV. 
Uh, these guys, um, especially Neferhotep I, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that for some reason, perhaps their upper Egyptian origins, their fascination with Abydos and the cult of Osiris, just like Senwazert III um, in the 12th dynasty, um, they were interested in patronizing and um, extending, developing the cult of Osiris. They built extensive additions to the Osiris temple and the statue in the OI is probably part of the dedications of this era. Um, Neferhotep I, in fact, commemorates his own particular kind of intimate connection with Senwazert III, the very king who built the monster tomb beneath Anubis Mountain. And we can see this at the first cataract um, in a particular area called Sahel Island um, near modern Aswan. Inscriptions side by side of identical shape naming Senwazert III of the 12th dynasty and Neferhotep I of the 13th dynasty. A hundred years or more apart in time, these two, uh, at least Neferhotep I, seems to have had an interest in connecting himself with this illustrious uh, forebear. Here's another one where we see um, almost identical images of Senwazert III offering to the god, goddess Anukas, um, and Neferhotep I doing exactly the same thing. So um, I think some of this historical evidence, these rock inscriptions and evidence from, uh, from some of the stele and um, there's this other evidence from Abydos itself suggest that this particular family, especially Neferhotep I, identified Anubis Mountain and the location of the tomb of Senwazer III as a place they wanted to return to. And so they added these uh, significantly scaled tombs for themselves. One of the things we've discovered, um, and I'll show you some images of this, is that two of these tombs were definitely completed and they were used for royal burial. They weren't just built as intended tombs, but both S9 and S10 contain remains of royal burial equipment. So these, these kings were definitely buried there. Um, one of the other things that we've discovered is a third complex, which is located up here, um, that includes another one of these massive chambers that was initiated. Uh, there was the process of constructing a new tomb of the same type as these two, S9 and S10, but it was never completed. It's an abandoned building complex um, of the would have been of the same design. And so here we have three of them. One abandoned, two that were used for royal burials, one that we can identify in all likelihood with Sobek Hotep IV and the other uh, probably with Neferhotep I. Um, in all likelihood, this abandoned complex is that of this third brother who uh, may have ruled very briefly, not long enough to complete his own monument. Um, quite a bit of uh, recent uh, evidence has come out from the site providing historical information. One of the things we've discovered near tomb S10 are remains of a, a royal uh, false door or large funerary stela. Uh, this is a really massive structure. The stela would have been about head height um, yay, yay thick, I mean, a, a massive slab of limestone. Um, you can see the re remains of a, an image of the king seated in front of a table of offerings, big hieroglyphic inscriptions. And these were really wide, large texts uh, naming the king and the, a fragment of his uh, a cartouche containing his nomen or birth name, Sobek or Sobek Hotep. Um, more important dating evidence has come uh, from some of the discoveries around the burial chamber of this tomb that I showed, just showed you in the photographs. We've actually found remains of the cedar painted coffin of King Sobek Hotep, um, including coffin texts of a specific type um, that we can date. Uh, there are specific forms of spells that appear during uh, a specific phase of the 13th dynasty um, that allow us to date the time frame of this King Sobek Hotep. Um, one of the questions, of course, when you get the name of a king uh, in the form of their birth name, or the nomen, as it's called, in this case Sobek Hotep, is that uh, there are often many kings that have the same name. And in fact, for the 13th dynasty, there's seven different kings named Sobek Hotep. So discovering the name Sobek Hotep does not necessarily tell you which king you're dealing with. It would be like getting, getting an inscription that says King Bob or King John or something. Um, so you have to look more critically at other, other sources of evidence. But uh, there's a, a number of ways we can look at this, including the, the datable evidence of the, uh, the coffin texts um, on the inscriptions of this particular um, 
King's painted coffin and narrow down uh, the time frame, suggesting uh, with great likelihood that this belongs to the fourth of the Sobek Hotaps. So anyway, uh, we've been uh, exploring and uh, documenting his tomb. This last summer, we excavated this monstrous burial chamber with these huge blocking stones covering it. Um, it's not as big as Senwazit III, but it's, it's of that sort of caliber. It's a massive monument, huge investment in it. There you just see some of us standing around the, uh, the, one of the blocking stones. This is the, the entrance chamber that leads down to the, the actual entrance into the burial chamber is there on the left-hand side. Um, just a, a really kind of, again, a, an, an engineering sort of marvel, you know, the, the scale of construction in various types of stones at great depth below the desert surface. Um, and here a view of the crypt that I mentioned, um, still in place, even though it had been broken into by ancient tomb robbers, is the burial chamber of this King Sobek Hotep, uh, tomb S9. So you can see there the recess uh, for his canopic chest, which is gone, and what, where the, the actual uh, wooden coffin and other burial elements, including the body of the king, once would have existed. Um, it's all looted out, but for a variety of reasons, we've recovered fragments uh, of his uh, broken, uh, broken uh, painted coffin. Um, this is the other tomb that's nearby, um, almost identical in, in form, which fits with the time period that we're looking at, the likelihood of uh, these uh, three kings ruling in rapid succession. This is the other one, uh, tomb S9. It has not provided any clear uh, evidence of identity of ownership. Um, but if our understanding of the landscape and the development of these tombs and their architecture uh, plays out, um, this one should have been built before the one that we associate now with Sobek Hotep IV and therefore is, is likely to be the tomb of Neferhotep I. Um, so really just kind of amazing tombs. One of the things we're doing at South Abydos um, is uh, uh, conducting in association with the excavations. We're doing conservation and site management work. I didn't put in, in any slides really of this work, but um, over the entrance to the tomb of Senwazrit III, we've built a protective cover building, uh, which allows it actually to be opened very easily. There's an iron door that you can open with a key and go into it and climb on down into the tomb. Uh, when we're done excavating it, people will be able to, act to enter it. Visitors and tourists can come. Um, we're, gonna, we're doing the same things with these other tombs as well, and we hope that um, a, a number of these tombs will be visitable in the future. So it will, be, will become sort of, a, a sort of a small Valley of the Kings, and in, in fact, a very unique place in Egypt where you can see uh, tombs of this particular type that you would, would not be able to visit anywhere else. Uh, in the country. Uh, just some views of the, uh, the other find that is likely associated with this family, this, this group of three kings of the 13th dynasty. Uh, very, a very exciting discovery back in 2013 that in fact sparked the whole adventure and sequence of discoveries that has led to the identification of Sobek Hotep and likely Neferhotep um, is this other cha chamber, this monolithic stone crypt that you see here. Um, this is the remains of another one of these complexes um, that was abandoned for some reason. They quarried and dressed and brought a royal burial crypt uh, to this location. There's a, remains of a brick enclosure that surrounded the site. And they began the early stages of cutting down into the subsurface to set this crypt um, down. If it, would be, if it was like the other ones, it would be at a depth of about 10 meters. Uh, below the desert surface, uh, but it's, it's sitting there just about two meters below the, the, the modern surface. It was left, abandoned. It's an abandoned complex, um, but it was a very exciting thing to find. Um, it weighs about 60 tons, so you can see now what that crypt below the blocking stones in the other two tombs that I just showed you, what that actually looks like. It's a solid mass of stone within which is cut um, a recess, a rec rectangular recess for the body, um, the, the sarcophagus itself would have been set into there. Um, at one end, a, a square recess that would have been the, the, the uh, place for setting in the canopic chest. 
Um, so the, the whole idea behind these tombs is to render the burial chamber as a solid kind of impenetrable mass of stone that no tomb robber can ever break into. Um, in every case, these kinds of techniques failed in ancient Egypt, um, and these tombs were robbed. Um, but this one never seems to have been used for its intended purpose. Uh, but we had a lot of fun excavating it. There you see the process of digging it out. Um, quite fun. Um, one of the things that one does, of course, when you finish excavating something like this is, well, you just have to have fun with it. Um, we, we joked around about filling it up with water and using it as a, a, a swimming pool. Um, my in Egyptian inspector was very keen on this idea, but um, we figured it well, it'd be hard to get that much water out to this remote part of the desert, so we didn't do that, but we all had fun climbing into it. Uh, here's one of the excavators uh, at the site, uh, one of the Penn graduate students, Shelby Justel, pretending to be the anonymous king who may have been intended to be buried there. And then we, of course, were wondering how many people could fit into a giant 60-ton <laughs> burial chamber of the 13th dynasty. Um, Turns out about 30 people can clamber on into the interior of it and sit along the side of it. So a lot of the guys that dug it out are sitting there. So we had quite a lot of fun. Um, in all likelihood, I mean, it's, it's a theory. I, I don't know that we'll ever be able to prove it, but um, the, the, in terms of the surrounding monuments and the probable um, attribution of them to Neferhotep I and Sobekhotep IV. Uh, this third abandoned complex may well belong to this third brother. Here you see a statue of him, uh, Saw Hathor, who was the crown prince of Neferhotep I and may have briefly ruled, but didn't live long enough. So um, we've come full circle um, to Senebkai, and I'll finish up here in just five or 10 minutes with a, a, a quick look at him and uh, the exciting discovery of the tomb of Senebkai. One of the things that is really fascinating in the recent discoveries at Abydos, if we just go back to this plan here, um, is that um, after these great tombs of these Middle Kingdom pharaohs were built, um, about a century later, um, about 1650 BC, um, through about 1600 BC, additional kings came along. These are the kings of what we today call, um, tentatively, the Abydos dynasty. Um, these smaller tombs, including that of Senebkai, um, they were added um, adjacent to these pre-existing tombs. Um, in fact, one of them decided that he wasn't going to bother building his own tomb. He was just going to stick a vault um, on top of this abandoned sarcophagus. Someone used this a long time after it had been quarried as their own burial chamber uh, by adding br a brick structure. And here you see the remnants of it. This originally had a vault and other elements that were fitted to it. It's a secondary reuse. And in fact, the whole place, um, these second intermediate period royal tombs, uh, were essentially kind of cannibalizing and uh, making use of the materials from these rich burials of the Middle Kingdom. This is the period when I think the tomb of Senwazert III itself was first broken into, and in fact, the tomb of Sobekhotep IV, probably, this tomb S10, that was probably entered also at this time period. Uh, these are kings that are not just coming and linking themselves with early, more, earlier, more powerful kings, but they're in fact sort of robber pharaohs. They are part of the tomb robbery process. They're taking valuable materials from earlier pharaohs of this high point of the Middle Kingdom and recycling them in their own tombs. And we can see that in a number of ways, not just this reused chamber. Um, we can see it very clearly in the tomb of Senebkai. Um, so let's take a look quickly at it. Um, we discovered it back in 2014, and um, the publication of it is, uh, uh, should be done, in fact, in uh, several months. Uh, hopefully it will be out next year uh, with details of the, the the discovery and the analysis of the materials. It was really exciting to find this tomb. One of the, the wonderful things in it is painted decoration with uh, cartouches and the, the texts that record the name of the king, beautiful images of goddesses connected with the royal afterlife. Um, so giving us the identity of this formerly unknown pharaoh. Really touching texts. When I read these texts, they're very simple ones, but beautiful statements on Egyptian ideas of the death of a king and what might happen to him 
uh, uh, painted on the walls of the burial chamber is an evocation of the king to rise up, uh, to come back to life. Um, he's actually addressed in the text, O oh, good God, Lord of the two lands, Lord of ritual, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Woster Ibre, the son of Re, Senebkai, justified, beloved of the four sons of Horus. Raise yourself up. Don't let death you know, be a, a hindrance. Um, you're supposed to kind of raise yourself back up into the afterlife. Um, one, of the, one of the fun things, I don't know how fun it is, but um, issues we've dealt with in the tomb of Senebkai, um, it's kind of a cliche, of course, um, vipers, snakes in the tomb of a pharaoh, but in fact it happens. Um, if you go back to these texts, one of the interesting things you find on these inscriptions in Senebkai's tomb um, is something called truncated hieroglyphs, where they, uh, they cut off the bodies of creatures, birds and various kinds of animals. And here we see little uh, snake hieroglyphs, the F or viper hieroglyph, and you notice they've been cut in half. They don't have their tails. Um, but in the process of digging the tomb, it turned out it's, it's been a place where um, horned vipers like to come. And uh, we've had quite a number that have appeared in the burial chamber. There you see one of them. Uh, there was a time this summer we had the tomb open. And one morning we came out and there was a huge one in there. And this workman, luckily, who's quite skilled in killing snakes, took care of it. It was a giant horned viper. Um, normally they're about a foot long. You can see this one's about three feet in length. Uh, we dispatched that one. The next morning we came back and there was another one in the cha chamber again. Um, so the Egyptians would truncate their hieroglyphs to try to control these uh, kind of threatening creatures like, like vipers. Um, and now we know the reason. Um, they're trying to infest the burial chamber of Senebkai. Just some of the other decoration in the tomb I don't have time to talk about. There's my wife Jen. Working on uh, one of the aspects of this tomb that's very informative is that Senebkai's architects, who probably built this tomb very rapidly after his death, um, which seems to have happened in battle, as I'll show you, um, they built it very quickly out of reused materials, including a lot of blocks that they simply ripped off uh, out of uh, pre preceding uh, monuments. Uh, so there she is uh, documenting that. Um, uh, a lot of questions about who this king is and his the history of the era. Um, I won't go into details on it, uh, but there's a lot of issues of interpretation of his name and the historical period, but uh, the excavations have uh, increasingly uh, kind, of, uh, kind of demonstrated to us the existence of a group of uh, sort of minor pharaohs, regional pharaohs, probably rulers of a regional kingdom uh, that we can call tentatively the Abydos dynasty who were using this place as their necropolis adding their tombs in the shadow of the great tombs of the Middle Kingdom. Um, and one of the very informative aspects of the discovery of Senebkai is the actual discovery of his body. Uh, many of these tombs do not contain uh, the bodies of the kings. These were uh, torn apart and uh, destroyed thousands of years ago by tomb robbers. But fortunately, Seneb Senebkai's tomb contained remains of his actual burial assemblage, including his uh, wooden canopic chest, uh, which you see here, uh, remains of his funerary mask and parts of his painted coffin, um, as well as the king's body, which is strewn in this chamber here, left there by tomb robbers. So there you see uh, uh, we recovered most of the body of Senebkai. Uh, he was once upon a time mummified, uh, but the body was uh, was torn apart and uh, has uh, suffered a lot of uh, damage uh, but, uh, and has been reduced to skeletal remains, but there are remains of wrappings uh, that indicate that he was mummified. Um, of course, a lot of interest occurred when we discovered the body of Senebkai, including something that I had ne had never occurred to me when this picture was circulated uh, via the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. Um, of course, uh, there's lots of people on the internet that suddenly had this image of the skeleton of Senebkai at their disposal. And here's some wise commentators um, uh, that noticed something that I, had never occurred to me. Uh, anyone, the first comment being, anyone else wonder why in the second last pick the left index finger looks so long? <laughs> and someone responds, well, there are bones missing from all the other fingers. Of course, the response is, OK, thanks, you're right. And it looks to me to be the same case for his left foot also. Um, the, the discussion then takes a, 
uh, a rather strange turn. It was either that or confirmation of the influ of alien influence in pyramid building, or the owner was a pro proctologist in life, question mark, and he kicked with his left. Soccer might be older than previously thought. So uh, this is the wisdom that the internet contributes to archaeological interpretation. The skeleton has turned out to be incredibly informative, um, and we're still kind of working through the data. Um, we, um, we've retrieved a, a number of bodies, including Senebkai. We're able to uh, do uh, tentative reconstructions, uh, facial reconstructions, giving you a sense of what they may have looked like on the basis of the skulls. Um, in the case of Senebkai, the most significant and intriguing evidence is uh, clear indications that he did not die of natural causes, um, but in fact died rather brutally in battle. Um, he's covered from the top of his head to his toes in uh, about 20 different major wounds, including uh, major axe wounds, cuts to his skull. Um, his hands bear uh, axe marks as well, and the lower parts of his body as well uh, suffered cut marks. Uh, and you can see some of this trauma. Uh, he died in uh, rather dire circumstances, probably on the battlefield in a way comparable to this very famous example of a pharaoh, um, of the second intermediate period, a little bit later in time, uh, the Theban king of the 17th dynasty, Sakenen Re Tao. Uh, we know he also died in battle, bearing these axe wounds in his skull. Senebkai is a, a precursor to that, an indication of the warfare and conflict that characterized the second intermediate period. And uh, we're still analyzing and interpreting the evidence of his death in battle. But it seems he probably was returned to Abydos from somewhere quite distant. Um, he was mummified to a certain extent. There's indications that he may have already, his body was already decomposing at the point it was treated for burial. Um, and probably his very rapidly built tomb uh, was assembled out of reused blocks. And so it's a modest tomb. It's one prepared sort of at the last minute for a king who's struggling in this era of the Second Intermediate Period, for some reason has entered into a conflict and died in battle, but has returned to Anubis Mountain uh, to be buried. So anyway, uh, many issues uh, still to work out, uh, just the territory of the, uh, the possible Abydos dynasty and a view of the restoration work we're doing on his tomb. Um, in future years, if any of you visit Anubis Mountain, you may well be able to see the tomb of Senebkai. We've uh, done restoration work to the, uh, the architecture of the burial chamber and the paintings as well, and there's going to be a cover building that uh, we'll, we'll enclose the whole thing and you'll be able to enter it. Um, the same with San Wazret III, the big tomb, um, as well as hopefully uh, the tombs adjacent, uh, the tomb of Sobek Hotep uh, IV and possibly Neferhotep I. So anyway, I've taken a little longer than I meant to, but that's my last slide. Thank you all. If we have time for questions, I'd be happy to take questions.